everyone. On behalf of the Centre for Investigative Journalism, we'd like to welcome you to this talk, which is Following the Science. And we will explore how science journalists have responded to the most significant science news story of our lifetimes, obviously coronavirus. Now this talk is part of the CIJ Summer Investigative Journalism Conference. And my name is Claire Wilson. And I am a medical reporter at New Scientist, which is the world's leading science and technology weekly magazine and website. And I will be this talk's moderator and host. Uh, we will be answering your questions at the end of the talk. Please do post your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom, which is at the bottom of the screen. Please do not post the questions in comments as we won't see them. And both the Q&A and comment section will be monitored by the CIJ staff. So please remember your manners and don't be rude to the speakers or each other or me. Uh, offenders, we are told, will be dealt with very strictly. Uh, this talk is webcast live on the CIJ YouTube channel. And please feel free to tweet about this talk using the hashtag CIJ Summer. Now, our speakers today are Sean Linton, who is the Independence Health Correspondent, and Jop de Vrieza, who is a freelance investigative science journalist. Now, uh, if you are a little bit puzzled, uh, there may be two Jops on the screen, there will be two Jops, and that is intentional because we have had a slight technical issue, which we are dealing with uh, by having two versions of him, uh, but it is the same Jop in both instances. So don't worry about that, uh, just uh, treat, treat him as one person. So um, I'd like to kick off by um, asking you a little more about uh, your job because I think hopefully most people will understand uh, Sean's, Sean Linton's position and what he does at, at The Independent. Uh, but Yop, as a freelancer, can you first just tell us a little bit about who you generally write for? Yeah, I'm, I'm a freelancer with a background in biomedical science, so I'm just a science journalist. Um, most of the time I work for, for Dutch media, um, like the newspapers, like the, the Volkskrant uh, and for, for some magazines, but I also actually also work for the New Scientist, Dutch edition, occasionally for the English edition as well, and for Science Magazine. Um, and I try to focus on the, the social, on the, on the intersection between social issues and uh, biomedical. So, well, like pandemics. Okay. And you've been covering both news and longer articles too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually more, more features recently. And um, so the pandemic has been kind of new that my features were now very timely suddenly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to kick off, um, wh why don't you start by uh, telling us a bit what happened at the start and how your working life changed as the pandemic began? Yeah. Well, um, when this started in China, I had just done one story about uh, about what we had the lockdown in China, and we were discussing whether it was a real solution. So I had just well, done one feature uh, for the Groene Amsterdammer, which is unpronounceable in English, but uh, it's it's a, it's a, one of the weekly economist like uh, magazines, uh, long form stories usually. And um, uh, and then um, all of a sudden, we had no cases then uh, in in the Netherlands. And all of a sudden, one of the first cases that uh, turned out to be in the daycare center of my own son, he's three years old. You might hear him in the back every now and then. Um, and then um, we started, we, we ended up in the middle of it. And then we realized also by talking with the municipal health people that they were not really in control. So we were asking for a test because our son had been in that group and he said, no, because he, he didn't have symptoms. And we were saying, but he might be infectious before symptoms. And they were, and we really got the impression that they were not really after this virus. They were not really doing enough to, to really contain it. And from then on, I just covered it like almost every week. And I was very lucky that this magazine that I'm working for, they have a, a, a grant scheme their own grant scheme, and they, they now pay me since uh, early March, just on a monthly basis for doing work for them. And, and I can also do stuff for others. And after a while, I also uh, started doing um, TV or doing research for TV because I was um, doing the same type of stories as they were doing for the Dutch, Dutch public broadcasting TV uh, news. Oh, so had you ever worked in TV before? 
Um, not in this way. We, I, I had done some research for like TV shows, popular science shows, on, uh, uh, but that's, that's a different game. This is really on um, the hard news. So it really changed your professional life then? Yeah, in a way. Yeah, everybody was complaining about their, they had nothing, not, no, no assignments, no, no work left. And I was just constantly in this room doing my work and uh, no time left to sleep, <laughs> almost. Uh, because, yeah, there was so much to research. And indeed, um, yeah, really sort of, in a weird way, kind of a finest hour, but, and you really sort of feel embarrassed about it because it's such a crisis and still, and also it is still a crisis also in my own environment, not just, uh, but at the same time as a journalist, this is, yeah. I think that um, all journalists that have been covering this will feel the same. Yeah, because it's the biggest science story of our lifetime. Um, you know, it, yeah. it's, obvi it's, it's an absolute tragedy, but it's incredibly uh, meaningful professionally for me to yeah. f be involved in it personally. Yeah, and also because it's so interesting because it has not just, it's not just science, it's society, it's politics, it's uh, in, in the mix. And I'm really interested in that mix uh, in, in when politics and policy and society starts impacting the science and the way science is trying to deal with that. And yeah. Okay, hey, Sean. Um, how about you when it when everything first kicked off um i mean when did you kind of know something really big was happening uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks for having me so um yeah well it's been an interesting journey for me the last few months because i joined the independent only at the uh, beginning of november last year so um i was hoping for a quiet year in my first year as health correspondent try to get to grips with the job and of course uh, i've had quite a baptism of uh, fire it's fair to say um i'll be honest in january there, there was some doubt in my mind as to whether coronavirus would turn into um the crisis that it did i think quite a few people were caught out by being a bit naive about it and i'll be the first to put my hands up and say i i sort of kind of maybe I hoped, but also thought this might be like a bit like the swine flu um, pandemic, which kind of te petered out quite quickly. Um, obviously that did happen. And very quickly, I think around sort of February time, um, it was clear that I was gonna be uh, called upon really to, to cover this in a way that was, was going to be quite intense. And I think even at that stage, I didn't realize just how intense this was going to be. And um, and it's not just about covering the, the virus and the science, but also from my perspective, looking at the NHS and healthcare in this country and the effects of that on patients. And, you know, the NHS went into this crisis weaker, perhaps, than it needed to be with fewer beds than uh, intensive care beds than most European countries, 40,000 nurse vacancies, uh, etc. So the, the NHS was really in a difficult position. And so there I was as a health correspondent and I, I've been covering health now for uh, about 10 years. And I have to say this, this in one sense, the good news for journalism after out of coronavirus is that it has hopefully alerted some news editors and uh, outlets to the value uh, of specialist correspondents like health and science. Mm -hmm. um, because quite frankly, I, I don't think we would have seen some of the coverage I've been able to do from um, if you didn't have some experience and the contacts that I have in the system, uh, which were able to deliver some of the stories that we've put together over the last few months. And you know, it, I, I won't um, lie about it. It has been a huge challenge, uh, both for me personally, just in terms of uh, trying to cover this huge story from my sort of living room in Walthamstow. Um, mm. unable to go out and meet contacts and uh, have a pint with people and understand the sort of situation. Um, it, it's been a real difficulty. And obviously I've had to learn about epidemiology and virology and the science of virus spreading and uh, et cetera. It's been, it's been an absolute um, frenetic learning curve, but also a great sort of, it's been a great opportunity, but it's also had an emotional toll as well, both not only for me, but other journalists as well, who've had to speak to people who are on the front line caring for patients and also those families who have lost ones tragically. Um, and we should always bear those in mind as, as well. And I think one of the jobs of journalism throughout this crisis actually has been to um, hold to account 
some of the decisions that have been made, some of the bad decisions, perhaps some of the decisions that were made without full knowledge and information, and also just the poor communication and transparency over uh, some of the data and, and news that we've seen. I think, you know, I believe that journalism has done a good job during this pandemic. I, I don't think we got everything right, mm -hmm. um, but I think overall it's been positive and uh, it's uh, who knows where we go from here in the months ahead. So you said um, you you uh, you know you were working all hours and thrown in at the deep end. Then what what kind of hours were you working? Has it messed up your your personal life as well? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure if uh, I invited my girlfriend to join me on this uh, webinar, she would, she would tell you exactly how difficult it's been for for her. But um, I mean. It, yeah, but it, it, you know, indeed, the, the the situation was such that um, you know, talking to hospital staff, for example, who were themselves facing a crisis the like of which they've never seen. Uh, you know, the NHS has been completely redesigned and reformed as a result of this. You can only talk to those people once they finish their shifts and once they finish their work. So, it's been quite common for me to talk to people late at night um, over the weekends. Etc. I mean, I am a little bit of a workaholic, and that there's nothing new in that for me. Um, but I think the it's it's the intensity um, of this crisis has been really quite something I've not been used to. It, it is it has been relentless. Um, every day, new things are issued, new data, new science, new expertise, new personal stories, new individual examples of things going wrong. Um, and trying to make the connections between what went wrong in one hospital, does that tell us something systemically that's wrong nationally? Do we need to be highlighting this? Uh, there were the daily press conferences. Um, you know, it's just it has just been absolutely relentless. Um, and I haven't had a break since the start of January, and I'm due a week off soon, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Very well deserved, I'm sure. I've got one coming up too, and I'm just uh, praying. I like we don't have the. If we're going to have a second wave, please let it not be for a week, so that I can I, have I, my I, holiday. The second wave yeah. can't come until after August. I, I please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know we're we're joking about it, and um, yeah, there perhaps there's a bit of black humour in it, but it has been awful, hasn't it? When you're speaking to people who are just in these um, really, really terrible circumstances but um, I, I have spoken mainly to professionals uh, rather than you know because of the kind of stories that new scientists cover I speak mainly to people like doctors and scientists but you mm -hmm. can tell their whole lives have been turned upside down by it too and mm. it, it really yeah. is something different what do you think about you know we're, we're seeing um, re reports of I've seen a few stories saying that uh, there's going to be a kind of mental health epidemic following after this among professionals mm. themselves. And mm. I don't know, does it feel a bit like uh, we're kind of, um, we're, we're always searching for the bad news story as well as, in, do you know what I mean? I mean, there's very little good news uh, about a global pandemic, I think. Um, but yeah. there, there has been, some interesting work done to show the the sort of the the opportunities that the NHS has made of this crisis to actually redesign quickly uh, something you know the NHS is often described as a bureaucratic uh, glacial moving system and actually it's been shown itself to be quite fleet of foot when it needed to be but I, I suppose one point I, I would just like to make is that you know we, we may talk a lot about coronavirus today um, actually, some of the most worrying and interesting stories that I've covered in the last few months have been those stories that are linked to coronavirus, but are not actually coronavirus. So uh, just for example, we've been written a lot about the, the use of what we call do not resuscitate orders uh, in yeah. healthcare. Uh, and there has been some very, very strange behaviour there with people having do not resuscitate orders placed on them because of their mental health conditions or the fact that they're disabled uh, are you, and things that usually wouldn't happen uh, and, and actually unlawful do not resuscitate orders and uh, all been done in a sort of panic rush by the NHS and some doctors and clinicians and I think you mentioned mental health I think we are going to see a huge tidal wave of demand for mental health issues I mean uh, a lot of coronavirus patients they spend on average uh, sort of 10 to 15 days longer than your usual intensive care patient in ICU. Now, anyone who has experience of ICU will tell you it's a very, very discombobulating experience and people can come out of that with uh, delirium and, and drug-induced 
um, sort of hallucinations that, that, that feel very real and can be absolutely terrifying. Um, yeah. And those things can last for, for months, if not years. And the virus itself leads to lung scarring, etc. So we, we have potentially in the UK, 100,000 people who were admitted to hospital who yeah. may have, who may have long term consequences from this virus. And the NHS is not particularly geared up to look after those people at the moment, and it's going to have to get to very quickly. And those kinds of areas, uh, I think, are, are where journalists have contributed a lot in this pandemic, areas that um, you know the government have missed, social care being the obvious one as well, which wasn't really on the government's radar until journalists mm. started highlighting the crisis in those homes. Yeah. Well, I think indeed it's that's one of my one of the uh, experts. I think it was an anthropologist who said this to me. Like, it's 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 a t stress test for the whole society, and and it's a political crisis. It's it's a social crisis, and all the weaknesses of your society will come right at you during this crisis. Like, it can be the social uh, issue, it can be uh, the health system, it can be um, inequ inequity. All these things are just worthwhile to cover and, and that's why it's not just something for uh, science writers with the background in uh, epidemiology or mm. virology. Yeah and it's interesting as well Job you say um, one, one of the I, I don't know about you but when this first started and I started to write some stories about the intensive care um, capacity in the UK I was told by quite a few people that I was being uh, scaremongering uh, and I was uh, basically writing bad things and frightening people. And what I needed yeah. to be doing as a journalist was supporting the government yeah. and supporting the country to get through this. Uh, and actually, I think that's a really dangerous position mm -hmm. because I think, it's uh, I think during, during a crisis, you know, you, you, journalism becomes even more important in my view. And, and that's been an interesting debate over the last few months, which, and I think actually a lot of the initial reports in the UK, at least, warning of the fragility of our system actually has been proven to be um, legitimate. And and yeah, it's 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 interesting though that people believe we should down tools at the start of a crisis when actually I think the opposite is true. Have you uh, have you had any of that kind of sentiment, Yop, in your country? I think now I missed one second of your because my okay, line was saying, down. Yeah, have you encountered any similar attitudes? Um, yeah. you know, saying no, we Very should similar. we shouldn't criticize because it's a crisis. Yeah. We shouldn't criticize the government. We should stand behind the government. Yeah, actually, uh, personally, yes. Like on Twitter and and, and related social media. Uh, directly being people were that I was very good at uh, where we're saying I'm muting you or unfollowing you mm. so no longer wanting to see my messages um, calling me uh, a panic monger um, and and also like we had a whole debate and even one of the editors-in-chief of the of the newspaper the Volkskrant which I'm also occasionally working for he said we have to speak with one voice uh, and he really got criticized for that. But a lot of people were also supporting him because now we don't need, because we should not do this to, critical, to be, be too critical. The parliament was also very uncritical. They're really afraid of being anti-science. Well, we were not anti-science. We were critically in a, in, a, in a good way, trying to be at least. Because it's the um, very nature of science that you criticize and you yeah. question. And That's I, not being I mean, anti-science. And maybe it's because of my background. I have a background in science communication and also in philosophy of science. And, and I really saw the, the complete mess up of, of the science and, and, the, and the politics going on. And, but they were sort of hiding behind the science. I've seen the, the debates uh, in the UK as well. It's a com comparable debate uh, mm -hmm. that, that they were sort of, I call it science washing the, the, the political uh, decisions. And, uh, and then I got colleagues who were also science journalists. They were constantly defending because yes, this is the science. And then I was pointing at other countries that took different decisions, different turns. And then they were saying, yeah, well, that's a different country, different, situa different situation, but we should be, well, at least pushing them to explain why they, they take different decisions uh, based on the same, more well, broadly speaking, the same science. And can I ask which, um... Uh, subjects in particular you've been you have received pushback on in in what in what um 
subjects? When, when in particular, were you told? Uh, well, you in the beginning, it was just about what work for you might be ready. Well, we in the beginning we were. We, I, I was worried that we weren't taking steps soon enough. We were. We had also the same similar debate as in the UK. Then we also had the the famous uh, herd immunity debate. Um, and well, but, but even before that, we I was like, come on, we should take steps. And then still, our prime minister was saying, oh, you could stay, shake hands. And, and we we were proven right afterwards that there's a lot of uncertainty still what works and what does not work. But everybody agrees that oh, um, taking the first steps in an earlier phase would be uh, would have been wiser, uh, and you might have prevented uh, having to lock down. Uh, that was one thing. And the other thing was. Um, in general, just pointing at, we were, a, a concrete example was, I was uh, w wondering what the hospitals would be doing and we, if they were ready for this. And people were saying, oh, don't worry, we have our, we have our protocols. And <laughs> I found that so typical. Um, maybe it's typically Dutch, I don't know, I don't know enough about other countries, but uh, to trust in their basic protocols. We had a flu protocol, just like in most European countries, and we had some kind of well, we have we had enough tests to do ten people a day. Um, that was they were confident that that would be enough. Uh, and now we're testing thirty thousand, and uh, it's like it's a total. And, and well, in general, they were just uh, against. Uh, well, uh, giving the impression that we would not be able to handle this. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, and even well, when 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 the doc there's the 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 head of the the ICU uh, doctors association uh, appeared on television saying well we have to have like twice or three times as much uh, ICU beds and everybody was shocked and everybody but the people that were following this from the beginning were like yeah well, okay so finally they're speaking up themselves uh, because well we were not really ready. Um, I'm just going to, and what I'm going to do is uh, when, when as questions come up, I'm going to try uh, for us to, in, instead of that, us doing them all at the end, I'm going to try uh, uh, to take the questions as they come so that people have the satisfaction of hearing their questions being addressed in mm -hmm. real time um, rather than doing them all in a lump at the end. So just to start with, so somebody has pointed out that um, made the obvious yeah, made a very important point that people on here will have lost loved ones to COVID-19. And of course, of course, I think we all have that in the forefront of our minds mm -hmm. um, when we're writing about this and working about this. So I hope nobody was offended by uh, a little bit of humor earlier on, but um, you know, as we do our jobs, we, we, we cannot turn into robots. We are all human beings. So, um, but I hope nobody was offended by that mm -hmm. earlier on. Then we come to our first actual question. And somebody has said, I think this one is addressed at Sean. Um, did you find evidence that NHS staff were being intimidated not to speak to you about the protective equipment shortages and uh, do not resuscitate orders, Sean? Uh, yes, yeah, so, well, thank you for that question. And actually that, that touches on um, some of the, the major work that um, I was doing very early on um, in the in the outbreak and uh, yes to uh, in both counts unfortunately um, I did see uh, messages that were sent to hospital staff uh, effectively telling them to not so speak up about uh, PP shortages and r reminding them and warning them not to talk to to journalists and similarly um, I think I'll, I'll split the question up, if that's OK, into PP and do not resuscitate because they are different and the, the reaction of staff was different. But on PP specifically, there, there was pressure. Um, and interestingly, there we reported, I think it was a, one of our front pages early on, of doctors who were sort of invited into a, a sort of classic meeting without a coffee um, with senior clinicians who were effectively told that their uh, role may be at risk if they were to continue to speak out um, about the shortages. And I think those kinds of uh, situations are endemic in the NHS more broadly. It has a cultural problem in that respect. And that's something I've written about for years, but we did see that come to the fore on protective clothing. But I think what was interesting was that lots of staff 
um, I think are getting wise to the fact that you can talk to journalists in the right way and to protect identities. And that's something I'm obviously quite experienced with. And because um, I'm, I'm known as a health journalist, I was able to communicate with staff who trusted me mm -hmm. to share information and share uh, documents and things like that. And so, so we were able to cover that. On the do not resuscitate aspect, though, I think there's an interesting debate there, which we could have a whole session about, which is that there is a, a sort of cultural issue in medicine and amongst clinicians around do not resuscitate orders and a sort of um, a, a sort of uncomfortability about talking about it. I think I've just invented a new word there, but staff are uncomfortable talking about these things. And we often find that it's families that speak out about those things. Um, and that's largely what we've seen uh, enjoying the pandemic. In fact, there's been a judicial review threat against the health secretary, which for those of you who follow me, there'll be uh, updates on that hopefully coming this weekend. Um, but the, the, it's a lot of families around the country, patients and families who've spoken out about do not some state orders. And, um, and we continue to highlight those because it's a very important issue. Um, so another related question is, have you find it have, have both of you found it hard accessing uh, the necessary data on coronavirus, especially from governments? And um, if so, how did you respond to that challenge? Uh, Yop, do you want to go first then? Well, we have our RIVM, which is the CDC or NIH, uh, NIH in, uh, in our country, and they, they have been publishing the, the basic data, but then there was, um, they're constantly removing the old ones. So it's almost impossible to do time series. And actually people from other universities, they have stepped in and started doing that for them and actually approaching them to help them. And then they were denied. Um, so that, that became already like an, a topic to cover on its own <laughs> um, because, because um, because well, that really shows. Because those data people, those data people are normally like the most transparent. You get them right. That they're that's their their thing to share everything they have, and then and now they suddenly cannot uh, do that anymore. So that really is a problem. Um, and I've I've not been covering like the data in in specific uh, specifically myself, but together with colleagues who were like more geeky and trying to sort of even like citizen journalists who are do, posting uh, daily updates. Um, there's a lot of very useful citizen journalists. I think this, for me, this crisis is also the, break, the, the final breakthrough of, of, of citizen journalism, as long as it wasn't there yet, because they've really helped me as well uh, as, as in doing my job and in being able to cover all those things. And which ones, any particular examples of citizen One specific one was uh, the very basic one was in the beginning when we had this, we had uh, our prime minister, Mark Rutte gave this uh, now famous talk, we will, we'll, a historical talk uh, directly aimed at, at, the, uh, at the public. And he was explaining what we would do. And he was calling herd immunity, even after that the UK had that debate already for, for a week. And, and they've, they've already sort of moved away from that. Um, and then people started calculating the number of deaths and we mm. would have like, we, we would need like 80,000 deaths to get there. Uh, and it was actually citizens were, that were emailing those calculations first to me. Uh, and then I was checking it myself and then checking it with the experts. And then later on, the experts were uh, confirmed that. And, but, but that was one. Um, uh, the other one ones would be like, uh, indeed, like the, the fact that they were adjusting the criteria for a COVID hospitalization. Uh, just, I think it was early May, they changed, they changed that. And people were just constantly uh, checking that uh, and, 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 and they, they couldn't escape from that. And now there's a boy now, in my room. Now this is another very uh, important part of the story is that the joys and the challenges of home working. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to just take a quick break there, your, oh, hello. There he is. <laughs> What's his name? He's called Zev. And he's been my inspiration throughout these months. <laughs> oh, actually, he was this started getting me. He got me into this because of the daycare story. So, yeah, uh, restart. <laughs> <laughs> so I will uh, just bring him back, and then I'll sure. Be... You you take a moment, and so Sean, did you? I mean, you talked yeah. a bit about this in regard to DNR or orders, but were there any yeah. other particular yeah. occasions when you were kind of stonewalled from the government? 
I think th there's been transparency has been a major problem actually through through this crisis. I, I think if if you want to get the trust of the public uh, during a, a crisis, and in fact the science is is actually there for that, that you need to have that trust of of both the public and uh, and the the media. And I think singularly this government has been particularly bad on that, um, particularly the, around the testing data and the numbers of cases uh, every day. Uh, and in fact, when you really drill down into some of the data, it just didn't stand up to scrutiny. And there were all sorts of games played um, to show that we were testing more people than perhaps we were in reality. Um, and for those who are watching may remember Matt Hancock's ill-fated 100,000 tests a day, which actually we didn't hit, uh, even though he claimed we did. But it involved home-tested uh, kits, which were posted out and hadn't even been posted back yet. And Throughout this, actually, there has been multiple occasions where I've had to spend inordinate amounts of time checking data, going over the small print and speaking to experts to try and figure out what does this actually tell us and what why are the government presenting something which doesn't quite reflect reality. And of course, one side of it is they're trying to maintain confidence when perhaps they don't have it them, themselves. And you know, one of the big investigations I've done in the last few months is on the testing regime and the lighthouse labs that were set up by um, the, the government. And they chose to go down one route, which was centralizing testing and creating these labs from nothing. And actually the transparency around those labs and what was actually being done, how they were working, how many tests they were doing, how many people were being tested, it's been clouded in secrecy and it still is to some degree. We still don't really know the full facts of that. Um, and just as another example of a lack of transparency, the government created the uh, Nightingale hospitals around the UK, uh, the biggest one being in uh, East London. And you know that was completely shrouded in mystery. Yeah. Um, th there was no information about what was going on in that hospital, how it was going to work, how it was going to treat patients, et cetera. And um, do stop me if I'm going on too long, but a, a little example. No, I really want to hear about, because you mentioned this earlier, what, with the Nightingale hospitals, what uh, do you think we should have known that we weren't allowed to know? Well, for, for example, the originally they were set up initially to take over the surge of, of coronavirus patients that may have overwhelmed London's intensive care bed system. And but actually, it, it only emerged weeks later that the criteria to have a patient admitted there was so high that, in fact, most of these severe patients wouldn't be transferred to that hospital. And so um, millions were pounds of spent to get that place set up. But it actually looked after only 54 patients in total um, and never more than about 35 on the day. And one of the biggest barriers to that successful operation was staffing but they didn't have the staff to actually man those beds properly um, and so there was a whole load of issues around that but what really annoyed me was that they just weren't being open about it they weren't telling us how many patients they were treating how many staff they had when it had started to admit patients etc cetera, etc cetera. and so one of the things I did was um, every time they seemed to be more interested in their social media um, profile and so there were lots and lots of TikTok videos and things like this being pushed out, which which actually offended quite a lot of other NHS staff who were working yeah. really hard uh, at the time, and they were seeing this sort of stuff. I think it damaged the the image really of some of some NHS staff, uh, and the debate on that still goes on. But what I sort of did to try and find out what was going on is it's, it's perhaps slightly uh, bad behaviour, but I um, would, would effectively started trolling the. Uh, NHS Nightingale account on Twitter so that every time it tweeted whatever it was I would reply to it saying how many patients are you treating today um, and obviously I never got an answer um, but what that did was that it was a signal effectively to other people on Twitter that I was asking these questions and because I was doing it repeatedly it sort of got noticed and um, I should say that I did try and find out officially and was told I couldn't get access to the hospital and I wouldn't be allowed to speak to anybody um, but because of that sort of ad hoc trolling of the, the account, what happened was that some people that actually worked there, about five or six staff who actually worked in the hospital, got in touch with me. And we were able to do a big sort of insider's piece about what it was really like. Um, and actually, I don't think that was incredibly negative uh, towards the NHS or the Nightingale Hospital. 
Um, it was a it was a sort of no holds barred real look, but that could have been achieved far easier uh, had they actually just worked with me. Uh, and I think it's, it's just another example of the transparency and particularly in the UK, the, the NHS uh, moved into what it's called a sort of national incident. And what that meant was that all media uh, requests and, and handling was effectively controlled from the centre by NHS England. Um, which again, if you speak to any, and most journalists will explain, they've had quite a tough time getting meaningful responses uh, from NHS England. Yes. Um, right, so there's another really good question here that I, I want us to look at, which is face masks. So as, as you know, there's just been a, a real shift in thinking on face masks, or at least a shift in attitudes. So the questioner says, why are the government so reluctant to suggest we should wear face masks? So in the UK, I believe we are not so reluctant at the moment. Um, what, what do you think uh, has caused the shift in attitudes, Yop? Oh, well, I think there has been a cultural um, like uh, resistance that was, and then of course there is a, a mixed science, mixed body of science. Uh, and then there was also the, the shortage. And, and our debate was kind of weird because in particular that our prime scientist, uh, Jaap van Dissel, he, had, he, he really showed a sort of a personal resistance towards uh, and uh, making like weird, really strange remarks at, at, uh, at air hearings. Like, yeah, well, they had them in, in China and they didn't stop the, the, the spread there, like, which is a complete fallacy. Uh, and then, and people were really uh, like surprised. And then, uh, even in, and then even in the nursery homes, they were saying, "Well, uh, it's it's creating a false sense of security." And that was really, uh, it's um, it's really a scarcity issue, but that was sort of presented as a scientific issue. Um, so it, it's part, it's a mix of, of culture and, and scarcity, I, I think. Uh, and then still, and then and then there's the I think the culturally, I think differ, it differs within, even across Europe. Uh, in, in our country, we have this strong, strong culture of the government shouldn't be uh, telling us what to wear. And that might be different in other countries a little bit, but that's that's why people are really fighting. I, I was in a TV, a small TV item once about this and saying that it's a cultural issue. I was comparing it with uh, skiing helmets. So first nobody wore them. And then after a while, it, there was a tipping point and now everybody wears them in the, when they are skiing and people are really uh, hate mailing me about this. So oh, you shouldn't be telling this and you're a, you're a liar. And I think, oh, wow, this is, it's just about a small piece of cotton. <laughs> uh, in, in, I think there are similar passions aroused by the debate over on bike helmets as well, on cycling helmets, mm -hmm. but whether or not yeah. they should be compulsory. That's why so. I didn't use the, the example of cycle helmets because it's as sensitive here in the Netherlands. Uh, sorry for <laughs> raising yeah. that. Yeah, 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 but that's, that, that, that's also our bias against that, and we don't want to see it. And then we, people come also up with, oh, when you're wearing a cycle helmet, you'll be taking more risk. So, yeah. But there is a big difference between um, cycling or skiing helmets and face masks, isn't there? In that with cycling and skiing um, helmets, the person who is going to be most affected by your decision is yourself, whereas with face masks, it's yeah. believed that their main yeah, it's not a complete, uh, parallel. Yeah. Is, in, is in protecting other people. And well, I that's, the, admit... that's the key issue, I think, actually, Claire. Uh, and, you know, we've seen it, the debate in the UK was initially around um, face masks won't protect you from the virus. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, that the, the science shows that whilst that may well be uh, the case, it, it actually wearing face masks protects other people. Um, around you, if you happen to be an asymptomatic carrier, for example, which we, we think maybe 40% of people could be asymptomatic carriers of coronavirus. Yeah. Um, but I think this is one issue actually where journalism hasn't particularly done a great job. Um, I, I think the, the complexity around the science on this and how droplets move through the air and in the environment, I, I think has been not particularly covered uh, well. And um, in fact, there was an, there was an item on uh, Newsnight last night, which was, uh, I thought, quite interesting on this same issue. So the debate uh, goes on, but I think Boris Johnson is coming round to the idea now of suggesting face masks in enclosed environments. Um, and I think the science is developing all the time and we see 
Uh, I think there was a new paper just recently this week around the uh, movement of droplets in, in closed environments with, without ventilation. And so I, I think as the science develops, the recommendations will develop. But it, I think the journalism needs to somehow explain the complexity to people. And that doesn't mean saying this is good and this is bad. Sometimes it means this can be good and bad. Uh, and this is the this is why these are these are the issues around that. And I think journalism struggles with those grey areas because mm -hmm. we I think editors always prefer to give a yes and no answer mm -hmm. to a question. Yeah, but it isn't black and white usually in science, is it? And no, it, no. Uh, and I I also do see the you know kind of straw man argument against them, and pe people say, well, what what harm can they do? But it is possible that they could do harm if it makes people. Mm. Um, yeah. As, as with cyber habits, right? if it makes people take more risks, and and we don't know for sure yet, I believe. But um, it is interesting that the consensus does seem to be changing on face face masks. So um, maybe uh, in a few months, you know, London, a street in London will look like streets in uh, Japan, street streets in Tokyo. Yeah. Where it just becomes, and it's a cultural thing, and we just become more used to it. Yeah. Um, We've had a, another good question about second waves. Um, and somebody has asked why Israel and Iran are into second waves. Mm -hmm. I'd like to broaden it out a bit and ask both of you um, how you see, I mean, is it inevitable that every country will see its own second wave as we, you know, everybody talks about the 1918 flu pandemic, which did see a second wave. You know, we didn't, yeah. we still don't actually know why mm. the 1918 flu pandemic did occur in that you know, cycle. There was a small bump and then a much bigger second wave, which killed far more people. And we still don't know why that happened. So um, yeah. what are your thoughts? Uh, let's start with you, York. Well, it is, it is already a, a very mixed picture, a mixed bag, because there are, in some countries, I think Israel is one of those countries that have done a very, like, suppress um, policy initially. So they have very they have had very little um, uh, transmission. So this could be sort of the first wave in a way. And in other countries, it hasn't gone away. Like in Iran, it hasn't really gone away. So would you then call it the second wave? Well, it's still there. But then it, once you get more movement and more, more uh, opportunities for transmission, it will go up. Um, for me, it's more of a question why we don't have a, uh, an up, upswing yet, because it's been, everybody is very relaxed now. Nobody is really, well, not nobody. A lot of people are not really taking this serious anymore uh, when it comes to like, at, le at least in the daily life, to keeping distance, not touching each other. Uh, people have small meetings, not, not, no big mass gatherings, but at least they have parties in their homes and gardens and, and not only outside. And uh, it's, it's more, of, I'm kind of, well, waiting, uh, and, and maybe it is the summer effect, but, um, but, well, as long as there are spots and areas where you don't have, you haven't had a lot of, of, of transmission, you will get it um, sooner or later. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we should, we, we, we would have time to go into the whole immunity debate because uh, it, I think it's still an interesting debate whether the, the immunity that might be there does play a role. Um, I won't say that there is herd immunity anywhere, but um, it could be play one role to, to causing some areas to have a smaller chance of, of get, getting you know, community transmission again. Uh, but well, the same as in our country, we've had it in one, in, in particular in the south, but the north is it's like almost untouched. So that's a sort of a, uh, it's uh, it's a it's an air, it's a great area for the virus to go, so to say. And how about in the UK, Sean? Well, I think it, the second wave issue is is a worrying question to consider, of course, because we all know what that means, and um, both from a sort of economic perspective, but also a mental health perspective, and just pure physical health. We can't lock down uh, again. The, the the consequences of that could be. Um, absolutely unthinkable, um, yeah. but so could the consequences of a second wave of a rampant virus. And just in terms of the general question, I mean, you know, at the moment, I think the World Health Organization has just said that the world has recorded a record daily 
number of cases. So, you know, this virus is rampaging around the world. It is still, you know, hugely prevalent in places like the United States, Southern America, and it's growing in places like Africa, etc. cetera. Um, as long as that is happening, the, the chance of transmission in a globalized world, even one with limited travel and, and cross-border control, it, it's just, you cannot control it. Uh, it will spread. Um, and we know that this virus um, enjoys spreading asymptomatically through large numbers of people. Um, so I think even with border controls, one of the criticisms in the early days was why didn't we close the borders? And in fact, the, the, the chief medical office has been quite clear that wouldn't have prevented um, the infection actually. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the country cannot live um, behind closed doors, uh, closed off to the rest of the world. So I think with all of that sort of in, in the background, a second wave is a very real risk. And we've seen already in Hong Kong, schools are closed, et cetera, because of a, an upsurge in cases. I think what we have to hope is that we end up with, uh, instead of national uh, outbreaks, we have to hope that we end up with um, smaller outbreaks, regionalized or controlled in cities like we've seen in Leicester in the UK. I think that is potentially more likely than we have overwhelming outbreaks within the country. But I, I don't think we can rule that out yet, um, especially given that this virus seems to spread uh, so easily. And just on the point, I think uh, Yacht mentioned seasonality. I, I was in a press briefing just earlier this week uh, with some government officials here in the UK who were saying that the virus seems to like um, four degrees Celsius yeah. uh, as, a, yeah. as a temperature. And um, and it also struggles in daily sunlight. So at a UK latitude, it's uh, around 30 to 40 minutes on a surface. But that obviously changes in winter and on a cloudier day. Um, so there is a seasonality factor to this. Um, and I, I think as we head into the autumn, I know people in the UK government and the NHS are very worried about an upsurge in cases. And we know we said earlier about there are never black and whites in science and health journalism but so I, I don't want to say a second wave is inevitable but i think it's almost certain that we will get rises in cases yeah. at least in some localized areas and i think i would paint that as the best case scenario personally yeah. that's what i've been hearing a lot too that from experts that i've spoken to a lot of people are predicting that and it's, so it's just a question of will we be able to stamp out stamp out those little you think mm -hmm. of them as little fires starting, can we stamp them out quickly enough yeah. to stop them from coalescing? So what about the idea of the, of the classical public health approach? And I've, I've heard that in, in within the UK, there are differences, right? Like in Scotland, they're really focusing more on that than in England. And uh, it's, 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 it's not been great, actually. In Holland, but... Yeah, it's not been great, actually. The contact tracing that we operation, we've only really just started. Um, and it's unfortunately, it's still failing to reach uh, around about 25% of people who test positive, um, which obviously is a huge number. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, being able to prevent the spread of the, the, the others, uh, the 70 odd percent of people and their contacts is good. But one thing that we're not doing yet is backward tracing. Yeah. Um, so finding the source. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what we're looking at at the moment is you're infected who might you have infected? What we're not looking at is who infected you. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something that I think we're gonna to need to do. And I think the plan is to do that as we head into the autumn, but yeah, alongside that is testing as well. We need to ramp up our testing, which still isn't really where it needs to be. And yeah. how about in uh, the Netherlands, Jop? Well, we, how, do you, how do you think the testing pro and well, process is going there? I think in broadly speaking, the, the debates have been very similar, but maybe, the UK in, in England or UK has been um, uh, a little bit behind us, <laughs> or but the, sa the same. And and they were they've been very passive. So there was a lot of pressure from journalists and from uh, external experts, like we have to do more testing. Then they said we don't need it because they were doing mitigation and uh, they couldn't keep up. And then but and then they said it was necessary. And then eventually they the minister. Uh, Those actually also because. Um, I published one art, uh, interview with uh, one of the um, uh, microbiologists from the north of the country. He said, well, I'm doing it. I'm testing all my health personnel and their family members. And then, um, and then it broke, that opened up the debate. And then the minister was first, was very annoyed. And then he sort of said, okay, we have to do this for the whole country. And now they have it, but nobody goes to the testing streets. 
because nobody is willing to do it because they're well, 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 I'm having a cough and why well, and even GPs are saying, well, we just wait for three days. When it when it goes away, it has been something else. It's like, how are we gonna do the contact tracing when even our GPs are not say, not not supporting this? So it's it's partly just a, a communication and and, a, and they're 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 just not uh, convinced that it works. They're not really uh, pushing hard to to make this work. And well, and then actually by this they're dis, they're disproving the use of testing because they're not using it. And that's uh, going to be even worse when we get into winter and you've got things like flu and other yeah. conditions as well, which they could be, you know, you could dismiss coronavirus as a flu case. And uh, I think that's a big worry as well. Yeah, I personally yeah. think... Got a bit of a sound problem there. I don't know yeah. what that was. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, uh, I think the government was after me. <laughs> <laughs> just stop writing those stories. Um, I was just going to say, I personally think um, universal testing of asymptomatic people, universal screening might be the thing that gets us out of this. Yeah, or at least what... like local, like th that's also a classical public health approach. They, they did that in Ebola, like they didn't manage to keep up with contact tracing, then they just, okay, we have a lot of cases in this neighborhood, so we test everyone in this neighborhood. It's, it's a classical way to do it, and, but then we're not used to that. We, don't, we feel it's intrusive, people, do, people wouldn't like it, or they wouldn't be at home at all, whatever. We, all, we see all these problems. Well, just go ahead and make it happen instead of seeking excuses for why it would not be able to. And that's a, that's a really interesting point, actually, about testing asymptomatic people, because what I think one of the fears um, in the UK is that you will end up with um, false positives and people will be forced to self-isolate for 14 days. And if they then find out they're negative for the virus, you actually sort of erode confidence in the test and tracing system. And that's why we're currently not testing uh, everybody. Uh, you have to have sort of clear symptoms. Uh, we're not testing anyone that's isolating because of that issue. So it's really complicated stuff about maintaining the, the confidence of the public as we move forward, um, because there are um, pluses and minuses in the way we do this. And um, we've got a question here about uh, weekly testing for NHS workers. Um, I So maybe I missed this, but I thought that was going to happen now. I don't know whether you know about this, Sean, weekly testing for NHS staff. So, so the, the, there was a vote in Parliament, and I, I think actually one of the reasons it was voted down was rather boringly because it was a sort of a Labour opposition motion as opposed to a government uh, motion. So uh, I think Conservatives were whipped to vote against it. But actually, th there is now widespread testing of asymptomatic NHS staff, not to um, that degree. Um, and what actually the NHS is doing is splitting its uh, services into hot and cold sites. Um, and they are testing both patients and staff more, um, but we still have a testing capacity problem uh, in this country. We still don't have uh, enough tests necessarily for everyone. We would want to test, for example, care homes and care home staff, but they are uh, enlarging this gradually over time. And I think um, we've managed to squash the virus down now. We, we have bought ourselves a few months because of the pain of lockdown, uh, and it will come at a very high cost, but we've bought a few months now into the autumn, whereby hopefully uh, we have much more greater testing capacity, much better contact tracing, uh, et cetera. That, that I think is the game plan uh, now. The, the government and the NHS are thinking about winter and the autumn. Um, that, that's their, their, what's dominating thoughts at the moment. Okay, we do have a few more questions. So I'm going to try and um, crack on and get through them because I, I don't want anybody's questions to go unanswered. So um, uh, William Goodwin asks uh, about care homes in the UK. What do you think went wrong, Sean? And then perhaps we can also find out about whether you think they, uh, they have been dealt with, how they've been dealt with in the Netherlands yet, but Sean, uh, I, I would love to, I would love to hear about the experience uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah, I, uh, I, I look forward to hearing you on that. But um, I think 
Um, I mean, we could have a whole hour's discussion about care homes in this country, but I'll bet, try and be as quickly, uh, quick as I can. First of all, the sector has been massively underfunded for, for a decade. Um, and so, you know, that, that's a huge issue in the background. Um, the other issue is that we discharged thousands of patients, around 25,000 hospital patients into care homes, often without the requirement to test because the UK didn't have the ability to test anybody. Um, we suspended testing in early March and we sent these people back into care homes without a negative test uh, with no, uh, and now arguably the NHS was facing a huge tidal wave in critically ill patients. So that was potentially still the right thing to do. But I think the question is for the government, why didn't it have some support in place for those homes receiving those patients and thinking about that more? And we didn't have a social care plan, for example, until April. Um, so as well, it was well behind the curve. Um, and I think overall that that was the biggest problem, lack of testing, lack of support uh, from the NHS in terms of just nursing staff, PPE, etc. We had reports of uh, care home PPE being requisitioned by the NHS um, and homes facing 16,000 percent increase in PPE costs, while councils failed to increase any funding for their staff. So the issues are huge. There are loads of areas where we got it wrong in care homes. But I think the biggest single thing was just not thinking about it quickly enough. I mean, there, were, there was guidance from Public Health England in February, which unbelievably said people in care homes were unlikely to get infected, uh, which, which is just absolutely crazy to suggest that. It was obvious from the very beginning that this virus was bad for people who were elderly and vulnerable. Um, uh, and I think in when in the fullness of time, when we have an inquiry, that is going to be one of the biggest areas of criticism for the government, I believe. I hope this leads to long term change for the social care sector. Uh, but I have my doubts about that. Mm -hmm. And well, then just before, sorry, just before we go on to the Netherlands, somebody has asked, do you think uh, uh, Boris Johnson is picking a fight with the care home sector? I, I think that was very clumsy language the other day, uh, and I, I think he, he said that himself. I mean, I think th there's an element, but this this government seems to like to shift blame to other people. Um, just in the last few days, we've seen talk of a big NHS reorganisation as an attempt to claim that NHS England hasn't been doing things the right way um, for the government's liking. I, I, so I'm very sceptical about that. I, I think if you speak to anybody in care homes, as I've been doing over the last few months, you know, they were facing an incredibly tough situation. Um, their staff earn such small wages. Um, they often live together in communal housing, etc. It, it's it, it's totally unimaginable that they could have prevented the virus from getting into their homes. They needed support. They needed government intervention, uh, and it was just not there. It was just lacking, and that's the I think the biggest failing. I, I don't think we can really blame the sector. Uh, for that. I'm sure there are things that could have been done better by the individual homes uh, as well, but uh, I think overall this has to be laid at the government's door. Yeah. And what's the situation in the Netherlands, Jop? Well, for the start of, um, just I think a general thing is that um, in most European countries where we have had uh, community spread, the care homes had, uh, had a problem. Um, and at one point it has been proven by the, the care homes that it's, it's shielding or cocooning it's just only possible when you have very little transmission. Uh, because I know in Greece, the, 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 the Greek uh, prime main scientist, he's a hero among the elderly because he managed to, to, sa to save them more or less because they, they had no, they almost no, they almost had no spread. But, uh, so and another, how, how did he do that? Well, mainly just because they locked down very, very rapidly and they're, um, uh, so they they might have the problem now and later on, but initially at least they managed. And well, we had the same problem, and there was um, a lot of. Uh, so actually, we had the highest uh, difference more um, um, between excess mortality and official COVID deaths, because in particular in in these care homes, when one person was infected, was um, that was tested positive, they they didn't test anyone else because they thought, well, they'll just be they will all be positive or not or uh, whatever. And so they didn't uh, isolate those people from the others. So whole nursing homes were, the people were just spreading it. And then there were no PPE uh, or at least not the good, the, the, the right classification for the, for the staff. And then they, after a while they 
said, oh, there are no visitors anymore. They're not allowing them in, but still the spread continued because the staff wasn't protected. Um, and th there's also this debate about uh, indoor transmission through ventilation that might also have uh, uh, created the problem. But well, in the end, we um, it's like 40 or 45% of our deaths are, uh, official deaths are, are in, the, in the nursery homes. Uh, nobody was sent to the hospital. They were just giving um, well, morphine uh, to die there. Um, and, and they say, well, that's because we are very wise and not spending our care, our healthcare money on, on frail people. But, uh, but there were also a lot of people that were not so frail and not being sent in. So there's a sort of a secret triage as well. Um, we're still working on, on uh, trying to really cover that. So yeah, uh, and then still, if we ask to the, the, the responsible, or at least the, the advisors, then they would say, yeah, well, what's a problem in all countries? So it might not have been preventable. It's kind of, because everybody screwed up, uh, it's, it might, that might just be the way it is. So I don't agree with that. Um, so, um, but it's very sad because, well, it's, it, because it hasn't created an outrage actually in the country. People really? are, when there's a story about Sweden or about Spain or about the UK, like everybody is outraged. And here it's, it, we have the debate and say, well, we even had some op opinion leaders that were saying it's about old wood that we sort of threw away. And that, that created an outrage. But, but then everybody's, a lot of people still think, well, there were 85, 86, and they would have died anyway. We have a, we have a negative excess mortality now. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's really annoying and, and it's really terrible that, that we're not outraged because it just happened the way it happened. We've seen that in the UK as well. I think it's quite distasteful, actually, the, the sort of dismissal uh, of these people's deaths. Um, you know, these were still uh, mothers, brothers, sons, daughters, etc. of somebody. Um, and actually, I think, you know, so the, the, the last decade in the UK, we have been writing about social care. It's, it's gone as huge headlines, but still nothing changes. And sadly, we don't see the level of outrage. It's not a... I, I don't think it's become an issue where the government feels it has to act. They've been able to just kick it into the long grass. They're still talking now about doing something about it, but I, I frankly won't believe it until I see it with social care these days. So it's perhaps this that. could be the crisis point that makes something finally change? You don't Potentially. Um, and I think the, the only point I would say is that, uh, you know, we've spent sort of something in the order of £350 billion pounds, uh, responding to coronavirus. The social care sector needed about 10 billion in the last 10 years. Um, so that, that was the funding gap. So I think when you see it in that context, it's hard not to see reform of social care as just being a policy choice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think going forward uh, with that context, the government will face real pressure to, set, to make a similar choice not to do it. Uh, given the amount it's spent on other things, but um, we'll wait and see. But it, it, something has to be done. We can't carry on in the way that we are. So yes, in the spirit of trying to um, get everybody's questions answered, um, somebody has asked what has been the biggest mistakes that the governments have made uh, in the panic. They've asked, asked particularly about mistakes made at the beginning. Um, so yes, Yop, do you want to answer that first? Wait, I was at the meantime I'm re reading a question in the, in the chat, so I missed this one. Okay, <laughs> so, so we're. But we're there was one at... question drop, drop there. So okay, could you what, repeat it? Yes. What has been the biggest mistakes that the government has made at the beginning of the pandemic, in your opinion? Well, I had this interview with uh, with uh, Jeffrey Sweetheart, uh, the the professor in global health, uh, global public health in Edinburgh, and I think she phrased it well. Like some of the governments, including the UK and, and the Netherlands. That they they thought thought they could treat their way through. So as long as we don't have too many cases, then we'll manage. And um, this has has proven to be one very difficult and two very uh, ethically difficult because we didn't know a lot about the virus and a lot more people might have troubles than that, that small percentage that they were speaking of. Uh, and that was a, a very early on they decided to do this, um, partly because they, they didn't manage with public health, partly just because that was their thinking based on a pandemic flu. 
I think that was one of the main things. And then they didn't prepare for the next phase after the lockdown. They started too late with that. So once you do a lockdown, use the time. Everybody was saying that, use your time. And then yeah. we all had to chase them down, do contact tracing. We were actually asking, calling up all these municip municipal health services, whether they were already ramping up their capacity. And they were like, well, we didn't have the orders yet. Uh, it's like, wow, what, what are we doing? And so that's the second mistake. <laughs> Okay, Sean, the UK government's biggest mistakes. Uh, well, I think we discussed one um, earlier of care homes. I think that remains uh, one of the biggest mistakes um, going completely. And the only other one I, I would want to reference is I did a big investigation into the testing regime uh, that the government created. And in fact, uh, what that really showed was that they, they opted to centralise testing in three big labs. Um, and that delay, the, the delay in doing that, in making that decision. So they didn't decide to do that until March um, when we knew the coronavirus was coming. We, we knew that uh, far earlier than that. And so they were too slow. Uh, setting up these huge labs took enormous amount of time and effort. And in fact, they weren't fully operational until the, the actual we were past the peak uh, of the outbreak. Um, so they weren't fully operational at the end of April. Um, and the peak was around the 9th, 10th of April, we think. Um, so th that was a real big problem because it just meant that we just couldn't test. Uh, we, had no, we had no idea how the virus was spreading through the country. We were completely blind. Um, and if in that scenario, you cannot fight a virus. And I think that was the biggest mistake, um, really. The, the, because of those choices, the virus was allowed to just rampage through the country. Um, and you know that that will in history, I think, be the be the big mistake. We we not to test people during an outbreak and not to make those decisions quicker um, was a real bad one. And if you compare the UK to somewhere like Germany, they opted for a completely different model, which was to ramp up all of their university academic labs um, as a sort of national effort networked to test people. So they, I think they had a, around 150 labs testing people regionally. And they were able to um, create a testing capacity which dwarfs the UK even still today. Um, and so I think there's there's a good comparison there uh, for how we could have done it, and we chose a different route. And I'm, and there's been no real explanation as to why we chose that route. Um, and, and I did try and find that, but it still remains a bit of a mystery. And many universities, uh, heads of labs, were saying we could do that here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was the key point, and there were some people who did that. Uh, and the NHS labs, of course, are already accredited, they're trained, they're set up to do this. These lighthouse labs are still not accredited um, to laboratory standards that we would expect an NHS lab to be. Um, and there's been all sorts of questions around how they're operating and the access to data and the data that they produce. And my investigation showed that they were actually technically breaking the law. Um, the law requires a lab to inform Public Health England for a notifiable disease. These labs do not inform Public Health England. They send a test result to the NHS first that then sends it to Public mm -hmm. Health England. And making that data available to local public health teams as well has taken weeks uh, as well. It's only just been sorted, um, which is just unacceptable, really. Yes, somebody has asked about that too. So, for instance, in the Leicester outbreak, the local public health teams there were complaining that they they weren't being informed of the of the data showing yeah. the local rise in infections. So um, do you know, is any pressure being brought to bear to try to change that in future? Yeah, so when we published my big investigation, um, uh, which was uh, three or four weeks ago now, at that stage, public health directors did not have access uh, to that data. Um, they are beginning to get it now. There is pressure on it now. But to think that we are in July and the end of June, and a public health director doesn't know how many people are testing positive in a certain street or in a certain office or work environment. It's just how can you fight a, an outbreak in that scenario? Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they are changing that now. Um, and I think the questioner was talking about individuals risks. And I, I think all, all I would say to that is that, you know, each of us has to actually assess a risk decision. Uh, nothing is going to be risk free uh, in an environment when we have a pandemic. And I suspect we're all going to have to learn to kind of think about our own personal risk as we leave our homes uh, and that's a difficult one to weigh up actually. Now we may not have time for many more questions we might this might be the last one and also I have a question uh, that I would like to ask both of you at the end too. 
But um, the, what might be our last question from uh, listeners and watchers, uh, Penny would like to ask, um, how much has ideological and financial interests uh, played a role in the handling of the pandemic in the UK and the Netherlands? Do you want to go first, Jop? National interests, well. A financial uh, and yeah, yeah, ideological. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I do think there are, I do see differences between like a country like like, a, um, like London or even, no, not a country, but a region. And same is for the Netherlands. They're very open and really depend on international trade. And I, I really see that get into the, the strategies and the policies compared to other regions uh, of the UK, for instance, but also other countries in, 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 uh, in Europe. Um, and of course, they're not, being honest about that um, uh, because well it shows that uh, well then then you get the whole debate about the economy uh, versus health but um, so that has that has really um, played a role although we we're not sure that that we need more research as journalism um, on that on, on really finding out how that got into it and we're still working on that and Sean I think um, financial interests, I think, as Yop said, we're, we're still going to learn a lot in the future, I think, about, for example, in the UK, who have, who have been getting these contracts that the government have issued for all sorts of responses? Millions and millions, tens of millions of pounds have been given to companies, some of them, frankly, dodgy and set up in very short order. Um, I think some of this will come out in the wash. Uh, and it, and so I think some of it will be quite shocking. Um, Remember where we were, I think, with um, uh, a crisis the like of which no government was really expecting. I think in some cases there was just panic, uh, you know, giving money out, saying do this, do that, etc. I think that will be uh, a source of regret in the future. From an ideological point of view, I, I think, you know, going back to what I said earlier about testing care homes, I think there were some ideological gaps in the government's thinking. Um, which it will regret in the longer term. It, it wasn't thinking widely enough about society um, and it was focused, I think, initially too much on hospitals and protecting the NHS when actually we needed to be protecting vulnerable people and those who were um, at risk of this virus in whatever setting they happened to be. And I don't think we quite did that as well as we, as we could mm -hmm. have done. Yeah, okay. yeah. Now I'm going to ask my question, which is hopefully quite an easy one for you, because we are uh, very close to the end now. Um, mm -hmm. So is that what what do you think is your most important story that you have written about coronavirus since the pandemic began? Um, can you perhaps um, de describe it so that people can Google it if they want to, perhaps uh, using your byline? And obviously it will have been in the in independent for you show and perhaps you can tell us the publication. Yop, do you want to go first? What story would you most like people to read of yours? Uh, well, it, it will be difficult to read in because most of them will be in Dutch. But um, I think, well, it's, it's been a sort of a whole series uh, on trying to dig deeper into the strategy. So that's sort of a full package because I did that for four weeks. Um, and one was one I did for TV t together with uh, the public uh, broadcasting people was really on the outbreak management team. And because they were advising, and it was very, very, very unclear. They were even not we uh, open about who was in there. They're not, they're not ref doing any references. So we managed to sort of. And then two days before our, our show was on, they, uh, they they put put on the list, you know, <laughs> because they said, well, it wasn't hidden. It was just not uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, and that really helped to make at least the debate about transparency. Um, so that was more like a classical journalism thing. The other ones were more like reflecting on what, where are we heading? Uh, but this was, I think that was at a, quite a kind of a breakthrough. And the other one was on testing as well, getting the testing. Okay, Sean, which story um, of yours? You have to be quick, because we're going to finish. I'll be, I'll, I'll be very quick. It was my testing, my testing Lighthouse Lab story. If people Google that and the independent, my name, they'll find it. But that was a story that the independent took me off the, off the news diary for a, a whole 10 days and I was able to investigate something which in today's world is really just lovely to be given that time um, yeah. and hopefully we'd do more as well but it was, a, it was a real genuine investigation from a standing start so hopefully students of the CIJ will enjoy reading that one. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sure they will. And I hope they manage to perhaps read translations of yours. Yep. Um, well, we, we actually really have now um, hit the end of our time slot. So thank you to both of you very much for being so patient and answering everybody's questions so clearly. And it's been a really interesting discussion. And um, thank you very much, Sean and Yop. Goodbye. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.